Hey, uh, before we get into anything today, um, Minish Cap is now playable on this Switch. So, play it. Anyhow, here's another fun little wiki trivia video. The series where I take a look at the Smash Wiki's trivia section and bring up things I thought were entertaining. Today's video will cover the first half of the DLC, that being Piranha Plant in Fighter Pass 1. Starting out with Piranha Plant, it's mentioned how it's actually very unique and that it's one of the only characters whose splash screen doesn't use the DF Gothic font. Now, I don't really know what font it's using, but if you compare it to the other splash screens, you can tell it's slightly different. I look at how the A sort of curves to the side for DF Gothic, but for Piranha Plant, the A just goes straight down. Basically, every character's splash screen since Smash 4 uses the DF Gothic font. Here's me typing in that right next to it. Looks the same, right? I mean, a lot of Piranha Plant's trailer kind of felt bootleg when compared to other DLC characters, or just anything else. But it's still kind of crazy that they wouldn't just use the same font as before. I don't know, is this font a reference to something from Mario? I don't recognize it in part because it's, you know, really basic. But maybe someone can correct me on that one. I'm not really experienced in typography. Oh, and the other character with a different font is Kazuya. Though his uses the one that's present in Tekken 7's battle loading screen, so it's at least a reference. And even then, his name itself still uses DF Gothic, so... Next, in a past wiki video, I brought up the topic of how, when a character gets a parry or gets a final smash, there's a little glint effect that plays on their portrait, and is placed right by their eye. Even for characters whose eyes aren't visible, the effect still plays around where their eyes would be. Though for the Miis, it just does an approximation of where their eye should be, rather than changing the placement based on where the eyes of the model actually are. Kinda like that thing we showed off in the last video with the eye glow effect from the final smashes or parries. But I don't know, I guess that's fair. It's pretty close anyways. But Piranha Plant is the only character in the game who not only has no visible eyes, but also doesn't really have somewhere the eyes should be. So in their case, the glint effect happens over its tooth. Which makes sense and is a funny little detail that I thought was charming, even if they made that decision out of necessity. Next, I vaguely remember about this, but Piranha Plant was initially meant to have three jumps, instead of these standard two. Credit to Meshima for posting this one. The animation for this triple jump is still present in this motion folder, so we can see it here, as compared to the double jump. With the biggest difference mostly just being that the triple jump is faster than the double jump. Apparently, this change happened on the day one patch, where its jump count max parameter went from 3 to 2. Which makes it feel very last minute, right? Like, it's not some remnant of them porting the character over from the past or from another character's code or anything. It sounds like they actually planned to have Piranha Plant use a triple jump, and I guess change their mind last minute. Though, the fact that we don't see a triple jump in Piranha Plant's bootleg trailer does make me wonder if that's even the case. Now, I don't really play a lot of Piranha Plant, but maybe one of the four people who do could give me their insight on how an extra jump would affect their playstyle. Personally, I'd be kind of down for it. I think seeing more Piranha Plants would be pretty cool, and having an extra jump is just objectively awesome, so... Oh, and if you give Piranha Plant an extra jump spirit, like I've obviously been doing for all of this footage, its new triple jump will just reuse the double jump animation, rather than using its hidden old triple jump we saw earlier. Again, they both look super similar, but I counted the frames and the spirit assisted triple jump matches the frames of the normal double jump, rather than the unique and slightly faster unused triple jump. Which is a bit of a bummer, but it makes sense since the extra jump just reuses the previous jump animation normally. Next, much like the fact with King K. Rool's glove from the last video, for Piranha Plant, if you get grabbed by a move with a unique grab animation while you're using size special, you'll maintain your different appearance for the duration of that grab. This is also the case for its forward smash appearance, which gets a little bit funky when you look at it from the back. Also, for the victory animation where Piranha Plant murders Mario, when he gets launched, you can actually hear the sound effect that you'd normally hear in-game. And I just think that is neat. Oh, speaking of Piranha Plant attacking someone who's jumping over it... Uh, okay, I I've gotta mention that the wiki had a prompt that goes over the mechanic where if a character footstools Piranha Plant while it's crouching, it'll do a unique bite attack which deals about 5% and KO starting around 215%. And I guess probably has some combo potentials, I don't know. It's an incredibly unique attack type that no other character shares, though given how weird it is to execute, it's also not likely to ever really get used. Now, I know a lot of you will be like, yeah, okay. But a not so insignificant portion of you will be dumbfounded. Like, wait, that's a thing? Basically, not everyone lives online and knows a ton about the game. 
And if the information that grabbing and throwing an opponent as Min Min will power up her dragon arm, a fact gone over in good detail during her showcase video, could surprise a lot of people on Twitter, like so many people, then it's fair for me to assume that a similar amount of people didn't know about this thing for Piranha Plant. So leave a comment down below if this is your first time hearing about that. I'd like to know that sort of thing. Anyhow, moving on. It's mentioned how Joker is one of the few characters in the game who fights the Master Hand boss on a stage that isn't Final Destination. In his case, he just goes to Mementos. The other characters are Donkey Kong, who sends him to New Dunk City Hall, and Sephiroth, who fights him in his home stage, Northern Cave. You know, when I see this, I can't help but think, if they're willing to let Master Hand appear in stages outside of Final Destination, then they really should have let him fight Incineroar in Boxing Ring. We mentioned that last video, how every single classic mode fight for Incineroar takes place on Boxing Ring outside of the boss fight, and, you know, the usual bonus stage. But if other characters can change up where they fight Master Hand, they should have done that here too. Okay, I get that there's probably some limitations with this stage and its background and how that affects Master Hand and stuff, but still. Also, can I just briefly point out how absolutely hard it goes that every stage of Sephiroth's classic mode is a boss fight? You really can't get much cooler than this character, can you? Next, for Hero, in Japanese, when you use your normal spells, Hero has a decent chance to say that spell's name aloud. Unfortunately, he doesn't for any of the down special spells, but yeah, we can even see these voice lines as an option in the voice test. This is contrary to the other languages where we only hear grunts. This is echoed in the voice test, which is 9 voice clips smaller than the Japanese version. It's a bit of a shame that these voice lines didn't make it over, and also a bit of a shame that they weren't done for the down special spells. Though, like, I kinda get it, because the spells are called different things in different languages and they might have thought it'd be weird to have him say a different word. Though for the normal spells, it's not like there's a menu or anything, so it wouldn't really been that big a deal. Yeah, I don't know, I still would've liked it being present, but oh well. Also, yes, all of this is the case for Kirby using Hero's Neutral Special as well. Okay, so this is a prompt I've seen before, but apparently, Hero's down taunt is faster when he's facing the right when compared to facing the left, if it's uninterrupted. If we try to look at this ourselves, even just based on intuition, you can kind of see how this is true. Hero, much like most of the roster, isn't actually mirrored when he faces a different direction, so his back is somewhat to the screen here when facing left, yet for the taunt, it has him face the screen no matter what. So when he's facing right, he's already facing the screen. So there's less frames needed to get him from the idle, to taunt, to back to idle. Whereas for the left-facing hero, there's a pretty noticeable amount of movement he has to make to go from facing the screen back to his idle. I can't really give you the frame data the usual way, you know, by buffering a shield input, because taunts can be cancelled, and thus it doesn't really tell me anything about the frame data of a non-cancelled taunt. And it's kind of difficult to tell exactly when the taunt ends and the idle animation begins, but that's why I asked Zek Fox for the actual frame data of these animations. Thank you so much for that. When Hero is facing right, the taunt animation lasts 83 frames, and when he's facing left, it lasts 87 frames, a difference of 4, with, as we assumed, the left-facing Hero being slower. Because this difference is caused by a combination of having a taunt that always faces the screen, and by the fact that Hero doesn't get mirrored when facing a new direction, that should cue you in that this is not a Hero-specific thing. And you'd be right. For some other examples, this is true for Wolf's up taunt, which has a larger difference of 8 frames. You can really tell this one too, since Wolf has to almost entirely reposition himself afterwards. And there's Kazuya's up taunt, which is different, but surprisingly backwards, with the left facing taunt being 8 frames faster. This is weird because, as normal, the left facing idol has his back to the screen sort of, and the taunt has him face it, but if you pay attention you'll see that, for some reason, the taunt is sort of sped up. He crosses his arms faster, then starts transitioning away from the taunt faster. You'd think that this would maybe even things out, but I guess this winds up making the taunt end earlier. And the wiki failed to mention that it's also the case for Hero's up taunt, with another 4 frame difference. So yeah, while I didn't really test too extensively or get more frame data, it's pretty likely that if a character meets all the criteria I mentioned above, which is a lot of the characters, then their taunt animations, as well as probably other animations, aren't the same between which direction they're facing. 
This wouldn't be the first time facing a certain direction is better than the other. Uh, now, trust me, I did a lot of thinking for how this could even somewhat become practical knowledge, but it's just not. As long as taunts can be cancelled, the information of how long their animation normally lasts doesn't do much. But you know what? The more pointless a fact is, the better. Huh. Someone should make a series about that. And lastly for Hero, the wiki points out how a lot of the runes that are on his swords and shields are actually Anglo-Saxon runes, and thus have translations. Now, I'm a bit rusty on my Anglo-Saxons, but I didn't really find many sources about this fact, so I just pulled up a little alphabet sheet and tried to confirm it for myself. Erdrick's sword blade reads Dragon Quest, but spelled with a K. And his shield, as well as luminaries, both read Roto, which is Erdrick's Japanese name. Solo's sword hilt was, well, really hard to read, as you can probably imagine, but I looked at it a bit and I think what the wiki says is generally right. That being that it says, BTB Karesi Mono, which is just a loose romanization of Michibi Karesi Mono, which means something like, oh, guided one, or something akin to that. This is a reference to the Japanese subtitle for Dragon Quest IV, which is Michibi Karesi Mono Tachi, with the Tachi in this context just sort of pluralizing the subject that it follows. So, oh, guided ones, or the guided ones, or, you know, something like that. And while Luminary and Eight's swords do have text inscribed in them, they're just not Anglo-Saxon and thus don't have any known translations, I guess? So, sucks for them. Next, because Banjo is the one who consumes food items, not Kazooie, when you eat the super spicy curry, only Banjo is the one affected, right? Which means when you use the Banjo and Kazooie dash, because it's now Kazooie facing forward and Banjo is sort of hanging on the back, that means the flames will shoot out from behind you instead of in front. Which I think is a really nice example of paying attention to the details. Okay, I mean, the flames kind of curve and stuff, maybe due to momentum or something. So you still sort of end up hitting things that are in front of you, but the hitbox is definitely not the same and still comes directly from Banjo. Oh, and even while Kazooie isn't affected by the super spicy curry, she still gains a frantic expression to accompany it. I mean, I guess I would too if my friend started breathing fire, so I guess that's fair. Speaking of fire, even though a lot of Terry's moveset uses effects that look fire-like, well, at least I think one could interpret them as being fire-related, they don't actually have the fire effect, instead just being a normal effect. There's a few ways you can test this, but the simplest by far is just using a blast box. Normally, hitting this with any type of fire effect move, regardless of how strong it is, will activate it immediately. Yet, Power Wave does not. So, there you go. I mean, Power Geyser does activate it immediately, but that's just because it's super strong, so, you know. Also, the wiki brings up how Terry's bind pose uses an A pose, instead of the T pose like basically every other humanoid character does. This is a feature that is shared with Byleth, and apparently Mithra. Though I guess not Pyra, just Mithra? I don't know, I don't know how that works. Oh, and say hi to Zek Fox again. Hi Zek Fox. Now, in the past, this was something that we could see in-game, minus Mithra since she wasn't released yet. But since that glorious glitch was sadly patched out, and I still don't know any new way to get a character to T-pose or A-pose or whatever, I can't really do that anymore. Man, I would really love for a new method of doing that to come up, especially now that they're not, like, patching this game. Alright, moving on to the last character, Byleth. Apparently, they're the only Fire Emblem character whose smash attack charge uses the drumbeat effect. <coughs> rather than what the others use, which I guess is more light, I don't know, like a, like a sword effect or something. And yes, every single Fire Emblem character uses that not drumbeat sound. Corrin's is a bit unique, but it's still got the same general vibe. I never really noticed these types of sound effect discrepancies, so that's pretty cool. I guess Byleth is getting those unique points for using something that isn't a sword, so good for them. Next, did you know that while the Byleth demonstration video was uploaded on January 16th, 2020, or thereabouts, for every language, for Nintendo of Korea specifically, this video was uploaded on January 22nd, six days after everyone else. I'm not really sure why this would be the case, and... Yeah, I actually don't really have anything to add there. It's just weird, and I like weird. And lastly for this video, for Mail by this right inputted victory screen, which looks like this, 
you might notice that there's a considerable delay between when the zoom in happens and when the losing fighters pop up. Here's a comparison. The reason is apparently due to the effects that play for by this whip during that freeze frame or something. And as far as I know, this is the only time that something like this happens. What this means is that you can actually progress through the victory screen before the loser comes up. And because progressing it pauses the UI in the background, that means you can completely ignore them. Which I think is a pretty huge power play. Like you're not even letting your opponent come up on screen after beating them. So I guess Sephiroth isn't the only one who goes hard here. The wiki says this doesn't happen for team battles, but I mean it did for me, so I don't know what that's about. I still think this is really awesome though. And I also think today's video was awesome, which is now done. So next time I make one of these will be the last time. Well, you know, for the more structured focus on the entire roster. I don't know how long that video will end up being, but after that, maybe the structure of this kind of stuff will be a lot more loose, since again I know people have made complaints about this series feeling a little bit less interesting. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, I gotta say, it was a bit of a crazy week while making this video. First, the Nintendo Direct not only Shadow Drops a crazy Metroid Prime remaster, but it also says I'm now allowed to play Game Boy Advance games on my Switch. Y'all, outside of the GameCube, this is what I've been wanting for a long time. So I am super hyped. I mean, it, it still sucks that they're drip feeding the game library as always. But hey, they launched with the Minish Cap, so I can't complain too much. And then after that, uh, incoming TF2 talk, so if you don't care about that anymore, you can go now if you want. But the TF2 blog actually made a post describing how they want to make these summer updates bigger. I mean, I'm not going to overreact and treat this like a major update like some folk are, but this is still like really huge, right? Oh, and after I recorded those lines, they changed the blog to specify that the update is holiday sized rather than whatever jungle inferno sized thing people were expecting. I, I have a lot of opinions about this whole debate, but I guess there's not really anything to be gained either way since complaining on either side won't change the update size, I can't imagine. So while I can see how that change is sad to an extent, I'm just going to stay very excited for the update, since I think general, themeless content is what the game has always needed, rather than being chicken held into some sort of overly Christmas or overly Halloween type stuff. So as long as the summer update accompanies some bot fixes so that the update is actually playable, unlike the latter half of Smith Smith, then I think there's still a lot to look forward to. So yeah, it was a good month. Really good month. Oh, and since we just did a lot of TF2 talking, I might as well remind folk that I do have a TF2 dedicated channel where I sort of just upload clip dumps on occasion. There was a very long period there where I didn't upload anything, and I'm still not really going to force myself under any schedules, but I do think I'll upload a bit more frequently this year, so give that a look if you want. I'll leave some links down below. And that's all I really have to say. Oh, not before thanking my gorgeous patrons, Rain, Scully, 7700, Burbo, Sick and Dank, and everyone else for their support. Stay casual, and I'll see y'all later.